Good morning, all. So this morning we're going to be talking about this uh, idea of loving as God loves and learning to love as he loves. It's interesting, you, you really can't read through the New Testament without engaging this idea of love. It seems to be pretty important to God. I think it ought to be pretty important to us. So I want to begin by just asking this question. Uh, what are things that we do for ourselves or to others that really don't express love for them. I'll start off, give you an idea of what I'm asking here. Uh, when I break commitments because something better came up. You know how it is, you say, yeah, I'll be there with you, and then I'll, you get this call from a friend or say, hey, you want to go do this? And you think, yeah, I'd rather do this than that. So call up the first guy or girl and you say, I'm sorry, uh, something came up. Bye. That's not love for them, is it? What are some other things that we do that do not express a love for another person? Gossip, gossip about them, talk about Well, I don't gossip. I, I share prayer requests. You know how that is, right? You know, you need to pray for so-and-so because, and then you, you, yeah, talking about other people when you are not part of the problem or part of the solution. That's not love. What else? Lie. I'm sorry? Lie. We lie to people. You know, somebody in the back there whose head is hiding from me. Yeah, we lie. We, we, and why do you lie? Because you, if the truth you feel like is going to make me not look very good in that person's eyes, so I'm going to lie about it. You know, I've got to protect my image and my ego and things like I don't want to have somebody look down upon me, so I lie. What are some other things? And that's not love for another person, is it? What's, what are other things that we do that do not express love for others? Avoid tough conversations. Ah, yeah, we avoid truth, tough, tough things for them. We don't tell them things that are hard for them to hear because we don't want them mad at us, all right? That's a good one. That's a tough one. What else do we do to others that really... By the way, what is love? You know, we, I've given you dozens of definitions over the years about what love is. And let me give you another definition. I think it's pretty much the same that I try to do all the time. But love are those... Love in, in one sense is restorative. In a sense, you're restoring somebody to health. Soul, uh, soul wellness and spirit wellness and, and physical wellness. You're bringing healing to a person. That's not always the case because when we get into heaven, everything is going to be perfect and God's love is still going to be there and it's not necessarily restorative then. But in our world, it's often restorative. I'm here to help you because you have a need. Uh, so love can be expressed in many different ways and a lack of love can be expressed in many different ways also. So anyway, using other people is not loving of them. You know, I want you. You know, I'm in love with you and really I just want you. Right? And I know when we're new in a relationship and maybe a guy and a girl are dating, they have this sense of wanting that other person and they express it in love. And in a sense, there could be love there. I'm sure there is to a degree. Uh, but then it can also become usury. You know, I love you because you do things for me or you make me feel good or you make me laugh or because uh, I like to be with you kind of a thing. Uh, that's not always love. So we're going to talk about this today. Uh, love, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians. Loving as God loves. And if you have a Bible in a seat in front of you, I'm going to be on page 987. 987. You can look at that if you'd like. I hope you do. Because I always want you to know this is God's Word, not just my Word. Uh, I'm just opening up Father's Word and helping us to together to kind of experience what God wants us to experience. But we're going to be looking at this, just three or four verses today. Loving as God loves. It's always going to be a challenge. When I think of God, I, you know, God is love. It says that in 1 John. 
God is love, and, and Jesus says God is good. In fact, he says only God is really good. And so if that's the case, then love must be that which is good. Love must be that which is like Christ. Does that make sense? If God is love, God is good, goodness and love must be the same. They must reflect the things about God. All right? So let's look at this, improving our love life. Okay? I didn't say improving our love life, but improving our love, verses 9 and 10. Oh, by the way, this is kind of set the... Uh, if you were here last week, we, we spoke, or Paul, the apostle who wrote this, spoke about avoiding sexual immorality. And sexual immorality is sexual intimacy outside the bonds of a, uh, a marriage between a man and a woman. And that is not love. Sex, well, sexual immorality is not love. It's using of other people for personal gain or personal pleasure or personal feelings. It's using other people without the lifelong commitment of for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, till death do us part. You know, you're, you're having what you want without the lifelong commitment, which is a picture of God's lifelong commitment to us. Now he's, so that was not love, and so now he's going to be talking about this encouragement to love one another. Verses 9 and 10. Paul says, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers through, throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. So he's coming to this place of, okay, this is what you shouldn't be doing, but let me tell you a better life for you, and that is to excel in this idea of loving one another. And again, let's, let's think about love as that which is really good for another person, that is restorative to that person, that brings out the goodness in that person. And, and love doesn't always make a person feel good, right? And love doesn't always make you feel good when you have to do something that's hard. It's wonderful when love does make you feel good and, and you, you know, you can feel good in the sense that I may not like what I'm having to do or this person may not like what I'm helping them to understand, but I can still find satisfaction and know this is the right thing to do. You know, the simple illustration is, yeah, you have to go to bed, you have to eat your vegetables, you have to do your homework and sit still. I'm going to pull this splinter out of your skin you know, your finger, and it's going to hurt, and it's going to make you cry. Those kind of things as a mom and dad does with a child. It doesn't make you feel good, but it's still acts of love. But sometimes love can also be, hey, look what I've, I, you know, I saw something you might like, and I bought it for you. Or here, let me help you do your homework, or let me teach you how to play ball, or, or ride a bike, or, or let me teach you how to love other people, let me help you grow up, and things like that. And let me help you do the dishes, let me help you do the laundry, let me help you, you can fill in the blank here. So Paul begins by saying, concerning brotherly love, uh, you have no need to, for uh, that one right to you. Brotherly love in, in the Greek culture, remember this is, he's writing to a church in ancient Greek a couple thousand years ago. This word brotherly love is one word, and it, it's a word that culture used to describe the personal affection somebody had for a close relative. Okay, you know, brother and sister, cousins, child, parent, parent to a child, things like that. It was, it was a genuine love. It, it's not a lesser sense of a love than uh, the kind of love that is described here where it says for yourselves are taught by God to love. That's a different word. But love is love. But the motivation or what motivates your love is different. So what is going on here is God is teaching people, you know this love that you have for your biological brother or sister? Now, I know it, maybe you don't have it when you're teenagers, but when you get older and adult-like, there's this fondness that grows between you and your brother and sister. It's a bond that lasts forever under normal circumstances. You just, you know, they're always there. You, they're always part of your life. He takes this word and says, I want you to use this word now to reflect how you feel about one another in the body of Christ. Now, because they are part of your church family, part of the church 
the, uh, the body of Christ because they have, like you, believed that Jesus Christ is God who came in the flesh and he lived that perfect life and, and it was an expression of God's love for you and he died for you and you believed and you received him, received that forgiveness by faith. You become now a brother and sister in Christ. What's interesting, in fact, in the Gospels, Jesus told people, uh, when, when he was preaching in a home and there's a big crowd there, his relatives were outside and they were asking about him. And he says, somebody came up, hey, your, your, bro- your mother, your brothers and sisters are outside. They're calling for you. They probably thought this guy needed to be rescued because he, he was, people were saying all kinds of things about Jesus and they cared about him. And they called for him. And, and when Jesus heard this, he said to the crowd, says, who are my mother, my brothers and my sisters? He says, those who believe in the word of God, who follow me, those are my mother's brothers and sisters. He, at that point, made a a pretty profound declaration. And that is, they may be my blood relatives. They were his half-brothers and half-sisters, his biological mother. But he was saying right then and there that those who are going to be with me for all eternity have a greater place in my life. Now think about that. That's what he's saying here. He's saying to you folks here, you, you look around, and, and I'm not saying that you, you diss your biological brother and sister. They have a very important place in your life. But what God is saying here, you look around and you see these people that are in this building or in the building down the uh, road a couple miles or this church or that church. Those are the ones that Jesus says, you have a greater bond with them. And the reason is, He doesn't bring it out in this passage here, but this is what we know from the Bible, is because they have the Holy Spirit in them. Okay? And because that Holy Spirit, you are bonded with them. So he says to them, concerning brotherly love, you had no need for me to write to you. You guys are doing well. You're doing good with that. But, he says, uh, for you yourselves are taught by God to love. This is a different kind of a love. Uh, This word here... Agape, and you know, the first brotherly love was phileo, like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. The second word here is this word, many of you have heard, it's a Greek word called agape, and it's a love that is generated out of the person who is giving the love. That's his motivation. God loves you because of who he is. Philadelphia is, I love you because of who you are. You're my brother, my sister, I love you because of that. Here it's being for. You yourselves are taught by God to love one another because of who you are, because of the Spirit of God that is within you, because of what is happening in you. I love you regardless of who you are. And they were being taught this by God. How were they being taught this by God? Through the incarnation, God became a man. He died through the death through the resurrection, through the forgiveness of sins. That was his expression of love. By the giving of the Holy Spirit, by the giving of the Scriptures, by, by the Spirit of God within you that affirms within you that God loves you, you're a child of God. You're being taught that even before salvation, but through salvation, through this journey of faith, you are being taught regularly, if you're listening, if you have faith, God loves you. And so Paul says, uh, you yourselves are being taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do it towards all the brothers. And he says this in the next passage here. He goes on and says, and in fact you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Macedonia is generally the Greek, uh, ancient Greek, now I don't want to say empire, but region. Today it would be you know, around Turkey and Greece and those areas there. Uh, in the northern Mediterranean Sea, the, this area had many churches. And what Paul is saying here, you don't even love, you love not just those who sit next to you in the church when it gets together, but you love people through, that are at other churches, as you should, as we should. And if you think about that, we ought to be able to love, because of God, a church, people who go to Northbridge Church or, or Chain of Lakes Church, and I don't want to miss any other churches, but there are you, you know, churches in Gurney, throughout uh, Lake Villa. If they are people who are part of the body of Christ, we are called by God 
by God to love them even as much as you love one another. Now, you may not be connected with them as much, but if you, get, if you walk into that church or if they walk into our church, there ought to be a brotherly connection and affection towards them because they have been born again into the family of God. All right. And that doesn't mean outsiders. And we're going to talk about people. When I say outsiders, Paul used that word later on in this message to describe people who are outside of the family of God, but looking in. They ought to be loved also. But what he says here, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Now, when somebody says do this more and more, the first kind of thought comes to my mind is, well, then I must not be doing it well enough. That's not necessarily what he's saying here. You know, you need to do more. Well, that means I must be doing not enough. No, what he's saying here is what you're doing, continue to do so more and more in your life. Okay? Now, it could be also expressing the idea that as you grow in maturity, you grow in understanding of people, what they need more, and to love them more and more that way here. Give you an illustration. I um, went and did something stupid. Now that I have your attention, I bought a 1996 Ford Bronco because I always wanted one. And in my desire to buy it, I overlooked some pretty significant things like the four-wheel drive wasn't working and so might have paid a little bit more than I should have for it. But nonetheless, I bought it. But now I find myself wanting to do things to it all the time. More and more. I want that thing restored. So I, I fixed some rust, I repainted it, and I, I replaced a lot of different parts, and I did this, do this. And I look at it and say, there's still more to do. It's not that I'm not doing enough now. It's a safe vehicle. I drive it across the country right now. But it's still, because of my affection for it, I know it sounds weird, but you guys understand what I'm talking about. Because of my personal affection for it, I want it to be better all the time this 27-year-old vehicle. It may let me down someday, but I just love putting stuff in. I like, like my old motorcycle. I could, I could look at that and say, yep, we can do more for you. We can do more for you. That's a guy thing. Now I'll talk to you ladies here. Those of you who have children or had children or someday will have children, you think about this here. You get that baby home and you love that baby and you nurse that baby, you change the diapers, the first day they're there and you put it to sleep and the next day you say, you know, I did that yesterday, I'm no more. That's crazy. No, you do it again. And you do it more. How many times you change your diapers? More and more and more. How many times you feed the baby? More and more and more. You don't give up. And when the child is uh, three, four years old, you're teaching it, you're loving him differently. You're doing it more and more and more. And when the child is, is 16 and they're getting their driver's license, you, your mom and dad, you love that child more and more and you, you cringe at the idea of them driving that first couple times, you know, until they're 30 years old or so. But you love them more and more and more. As their needs change, you change in how you love them because you are studying them, you are watching them, you are engaged in, with them, and you want them to be mature, right? And you love them more and more and more. It's not that you love them less and less at a time. It's now that you love them because they are changing and you are changing. And that's what it means to love like God loves, right? He loves us more and more. He doesn't give up on us. He has this love that is steadfast. I love this word in the Old Testament. It says God's steadfast love. It's a, it's a common theme in the Old Testament. His steadfast love. His loyal love. It means it just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing into our lives. He is relentless and he doesn't give up. It's just always grabbing hold of us where we need to grab hold of. And that's what Paul is talking about here. But now he's going to go into this I did. You need to love more and more, but now I'm going to give you a practical love and what love looks like in your, in your life, and that is living out your love. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 together. He says, and to aspire. Well, let me pick it up here um, in, in the verse 10 a little bit here. He says, but we urge you, brothers, do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, 
and to work with your own hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and to be dependent upon no one. One of the problems that apparently Paul heard about in this church was um, in the book of First Thessalonians and the other letter of Second Thessalonians, Paul talks about the end times because there's questions about Christ returning, when he's going to return. And apparently for some people, if Christ is going to return any day, then I'm going to, I don't need to work anymore. And Paul's going to say, no, 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 you got to work. In fact, some people saw the generosity of the church as saying, oh, you know, this is a freebie here. And, you know, it's not love. That's not love to help people with needs when they are fully capable of helping themselves. And so that's kind of the idea here. So he says this here, make it your ambition. Uh, the word ambition, make it your goal in life. Make it something that's very important to you. Focus on this fact and say, I have a personal goal in my life. And there's nothing wrong with having personal goals. He says, here's what your personal goal should be. Grow up. Stop acting like children with your mouths open all the time for other people to feed you and take care of you. You're old enough, you're strong enough, you've got the ability. Now I'm not talking, to, Paul would not say, hey, the person's got laid off or they have some emergency medical bills, the church can't help them. Of course we step in and help people who have legitimate needs. What he's saying here is, these aren't really legitimate and it would not be an act of love for us to help people who have the ability to help themselves but who just have their hands out. That's not what God desired for them. So he says, make it your ambition. First of all, he, he mentions four things. Three of them are on this passage here. Number one, to live a quiet life. That means don't stir up trouble with other people. It's not saying you can't, you know, zip it up and uh, you can speak two or three words a day, you know. Something like that. Story, okay, I'll tell you a funny story since we have the time. A man was really, this is about 300 years ago, 200 years ago, a man was really devoted to God and decided the best thing he can do is, is, is join a monastery uh, uh, as a monk. And he joined this particular one where they were only allowed to say um, two words every 10 years. Yeah, what? Okay, it's, it's, you know. You, so he, the man joins it, and after 10 years, he thought very carefully about what he would say, and so the 10 years came up, and he said, um, bed hard. <laughs> Another 10 years goes by, and finally this time comes, and, and he has two more words to say, and he thought very carefully about it. And he went up to his superior and said, uh, food stinks. <laughs> Quiet life, huh? And anyway, 10 years later, it goes on, and, and he says to his, uh, um, goes up to the Monsignor, the, the, the high monk and whatever it is, and his two words were, I quit. <laughs> and the Monsignor looked at him and says, well, I'm not surprised. You've been complaining ever since you got here. <laughs> All right. That was funny, wasn't it? That's not what he's talking about, living a quiet life. All right? What he's talking about here is don't be stirring up trouble. Don't be engaged unnecessarily in controversy. All right? The second point, he says, uh, mind your own business. Now, we like to say that quite a bit to people, right? When they're looking into our business. But it's okay when we're looking into their business because then they need our advice. Then they need our counsel. Then they need us to tell them how to get their, you know, you need to do it this way. You need to be doing this. You do need to do that. And, and quite frankly, none of that is found in here. Now, we're not talking about people who are, who are committing a gross sin that is hurting people. We have a right and a duty to quietly take them aside and admonish them, right? But here it's just busybodies. People who have all this free time, and in their free time, they're looking into your shopping cart to see what you're doing. Now, why do I say it that way here? I remember when I was in Custer, South Dakota, and it was a small town and had a small grocery store. And I'd run, I, I remember this specifically one night I ran into one of the people who comes to church, and um, 
there's her shopping cart, and you can't help but look into it, and she was just totally embarrassed because she had a 12-pack of beer in there, and she so desperately wanted to cover it up, I could tell she wanted to move on, and I wasn't judging her. But in one sense, that's what he's talking about here. Stop looking in other people's shopping cart to see what they're up to. If it's not your affair, it's not your affair. And it's stirring up hurt in the church. It's not love. The third point he brings out here is to work with your own hands. In the Greek culture, uh, physical labor was kind of frowned upon. It was seen as kind of like a second-class, third-class caste system. Uh, you weren't the intelligent people. You weren't the privileged people. You were a laborer, digging ditches or working in the sewer system, whatever they did, and it was kind of frowned upon. And what, but what Paul is saying here, no, that's an Whatever you do with your hands is honorable to God. God loves it when people give themselves over to a laborious thing to achieve things. It doesn't matter what you do in life, whether it's mowing grass or, or building things or working in an administrative field or whatever it is. It's honorable to God. But what is not honorable, and I'm not talking about people who have physical disabilities, who, who, who have age issues, or... Uh, you have been injured. Those who can, who are capable, need to be working. Okay? Because if you're not working, you still have the same amount of time. And what are you going to do with that time? You're going to be tempted to be a busy body and to be stirring up trouble. And the cure for that is get busy, do some work. Okay? Now, some people get laid off, but they should look for work. That's what Paul is saying, you know, here. Go to the next verse, and the fourth thing comes up. He says, in this way, you will win respect with those who are not believers. Now, in the Bible, in the seat, if you're using that one, it says outsiders. But it's talking about people who are not part inside the church or inside the body of Christ, who, but who are looking into it with a sense of curiosity or who are might seeking truth, who want to understand, is this something I want to give myself to? And if they look in and they see a bunch of busybodies, people who are looking over everybody else's shoulders and who are not working, they might just say, why? I don't want to be any part of that. And so he says, you're being watched. You're being investigated. You will win their respect for those who are not believers if they see that you are diligent, you're working, you're not just looking for handouts, you're not busy. Uh, in, in one of the things that we hear, whether it's valid or not, are people in this world who say the church is so judgmental. I don't know how valid that is. There is some validity to that, but some of it is just plain, you know, I don't want to go to church and any excuse will do kind of a thing. I don't want to be judged, but sometimes they do find themselves being judged. And if they can look into this church here or the, you know, the other church and say, no, there's actual love for one another there. They actually care for one another there. They're actually doing work with their own hands. They're not getting handouts from the, well, the government didn't give much handouts back in those days, but you know, they're, they're actually productive people. They're helping people. They're not dependent upon people. They're not gossiping about people. They're not busybodies. They're not looking over everybody's shoulder, uh, uh, causing or stirring up trouble. I don't mind being a part of that, and I might come and investigate it. And you will not have to... The final point here is that if you do these things, you will not have to, to depend upon anyone for what you need. And that's what God wants... He wants us to depend upon him, but he gave us a healthy body, generally speaking, and expects us to, to work. I want to close with this passage. I don't know if you can see it very well, but it's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In a moment, we're going to have uh, a mom and a dad come up here with their child for a child dedication here. And I, I hope this message resonates with all of us in the sense of this is what we're training young people to become, okay? Okay to how to work and how to be self-sufficient and how to you know, not be a busybody and not be you know, critical or a gossiper, but somebody who is a productive part of the body of Christ. But when it comes to love, when, we, when, we, when he talks about love, 
this is probably one of the most practical applica- or, or instructions of what love looks like. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Now, it doesn't say these things because these things are easy. It says it because you need to be patient in this world. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love is very important to God. It's very important to him that we learn to love one another. And this probably is one of the best passages if you need to think about a passage on what love looks like, brotherly love or love for one another because of uh, who you are. This is a passage that you should put to mind. And these admonitions speak of the fact that these are really needed in this world. We need to be patient with one another. We need to be kind because... People are going to fall and hurt themselves or hurt us, and we can still be kind. And We need not be jealous and worry about what other people have that we don't have, and we don't need to boast in front of people and say, you know, look at how wonderful I am. We don't need to be uh, irritable and, you know, or insist on our own way. And I can get irritable with people, and God is constantly, regularly speaking to me about, you know, that don't be irritable. They're not doing anything wrong kind of a thing. They're not hurting you. It's not resentful. It doesn't remember things or, or keep things uh, in memory and, and, and such forth like that. Uh, but it rejoices with people in what is right. You're glad when people are successful. You're happy for them. You want them to be successful. And you bear with them all things. You don't just quit on people when, when life gets hard between you and them. You're there for them. And you believe in all things. It doesn't mean you believe the fact that uh, I I believe in evil or I believe in falsehood. That's not what he's talking about. But you believe in what God can do to people and in people and through people. You you have hope for them because if they're looking for God, um, and it it endures all things. So we have kids coming back in here now because they're going to be part of this. uh, We want them to be part of this child dedication. Uh, 